And when you think about it, robots really have a bad rap in film and TV. Surely they can't all be trying to murder us and take over the planet. When the Iron Giant hit theaters, we were introduced to a new kind of misunderstood machine and immediately found ourselves rooting for the big lug. Robot overlords be damned. I'm Neil McNeil with Channel Frederator, and today we're going big with a beloved cult classic. Are you a die-hard fan or just wondering if it's worth a watch? We've got something for everyone as we count down the 107 facts you should know about the Iron Giant. Like, did you know that during production, the scene where Hogarth explains to the giant what a soul is had the entire crew in tears? Yeah, there's more of that good stuff coming your way. Let's get started. Fact number one, the movie The Iron Giant is based upon the 1968 book The Iron Man by Ted Hughes, though there are some pretty major differences. The book's story mainly took place in England and had the giant defend the Earth from a giant space dragon. Number two, the original book grew from a story that Hughes would tell his children to comfort them after the loss of their mother. Number three, when the story was brought to America, it was renamed to avoid any confusion with the Marvel comic series Iron Man. The new name? The Iron Giant. Number four, the idea for an animated adaptation was pitched to Don Bluth by Richard Baisley in 1991. The idea was initially rejected because the story had to be reworked from the original, and Don felt it was only enough for a 20-minute featurette and not a feature-length film. Number five, six years later, while working at Disney as a lead animator on the film Hercules, Basley received a call from an animator friend at Warner Brothers that told him the Warner Brothers was looking to make a movie based on the Iron Man. After hearing this, Basley decided to reach out to the film's director, Brad Bird. Shortly after, Basley was brought on board as a lead animator. Number six, The Iron Giant was Bird's first animated project as a director, though you're probably familiar with some of his other work, such as Ratatouille, The Incredibles, and The Simpsons. Number seven, Bird initially pitched the idea for the movie to Warner Brothers by asking, what if a gun had a soul and chose not to be a gun. Number eight, Bird wanted to create an animated story that was a story first and an animation second, thereby proving that animated films could contain something for both children and adults. Number nine, many assumed that the film was a statement on gun control, but in an interview, Bird revealed that was only part of the story. He instead intended for the film to be an exploration of the destructiveness hidden within everyone. Number 10, before the story was adapted into an animated film, The Iron Man was written as a musical by Pete Townsend, guitarist for the rock band The Who. Number 11, the movie screenplay was written by by Tim McCanleys, who also wrote for Dennis the Menace Strikes Again and Smallville. Bird was hesitant about bringing on another writer, but was won over by McCanley's screenplay for the film Secondhand Lions. Number 12, before beginning production, a copy of the script was sent to Hughes. He loved it and sent a personal letter to the writers praising them for their interpretation. Number 13, the film does have several differences from the book. One of those differences is the location. The book takes place in London, whereas the film takes place in a small town in Maine called Rockwell. Number 14, also both the characters of Kent and Dean were completely original characters made for the movie. No characters like them appeared in the book. Number 15, yet another difference lies in the giant's origins. In the film, the giant crashes from outer space, but in the book, he simply comes from the ocean. Bird didn't want this origin because he didn't want people wondering why the robot wasn't rusted. The film does pay homage to the original idea, though, by having the giant land in the ocean before making his way to land. Number 16, the film script also went through several changes before entering production. The original draft was much darker and involved the US and Soviet Union declaring nuclear war on one another. You know, classic Cold War stuff. Number 17, Townsend's musical was seen as a possible good fit for the film adaptation, and the story was eventually picked up by Warner Brothers. But Bird couldn't see it as a musical and decided not to use any of Townsend's music for the movie. Number 18, don't worry about Pete though, music or not, he still received an executive producer credit on the film. Number 19, when Townsend heard that none of his music would be used in the film, he responded quite frankly by saying, whatever, I got paid. Despite his initially skeptical attitude towards the film, he greatly enjoyed the final product. Number 20, Bird wanted the film to focus on the main character and the giant. He described the character's relationship as a parent and child bond. Number 21, the original sketches of the giant were done by Brad Bird's good friend, Joe Johnston. Johnston was also responsible for several designs used for the original Star Wars trilogy. Number 22, the film had about 50 animators and 75 cleanup artists, resulting in 125 people working on the same character. Because of all the different artists working on every character, Bird and the head of animation, Tony Fusil, had to take an extra measure to ensure that the characters didn't end up looking completely different from scene to scene. 
Number 23, while most of the film is drawn in traditional 2D, the giant was rendered in CGI. This was done to help show the mass and solidity of the giant and to separate him from everything else in the film. Number 24, this was the first time a traditional animated film also incorporated a fully computer-generated character. Because of this, the film's production created a lot of innovations in animation, including techniques and custom software. Number 25, when designing the giant, Bird told his crew to imagine that they were in the year 1940 and to draw things as if they were from that time period. This would also help match the 19 1950s setting of the film. Number 26, in order to blend the CGI giant with the 2D animation, a computer program was created specifically to make the lines of the giant wobble and make him look more hand-drawn. Number 27, another way that the team blended the giant into the film was an animation technique known as animating on twos. This meant that instead of moving to the film's full frame rate, the giant would only change positions every two frames. Number 28, special software was developed to help with the shading of the giant. However, this was still relatively early in the days of CGI and there were certain limitations to the technology. Instead, Bird decided to simplify the shading on the 2D animation in order to further blend the two animation styles. Number 29, the film was heavily inspired by sci-fi films from the 1950s, with visual influences taken directly from the film The Day the Earth Stood Still. Number 30, other influences from the film included the works of artist Norman Rockwell, Edward Hopper, and N.C. Wythe. The name of the small town Rockwell was chosen as a nod to the artist who helped serve as inspiration. Number 31, the art team also traveled to Maine to study the environment. While there, the art team took pictures of landscapes, buildings, and even the bark on the trees to use as reference. Number 32, a small town in Maine was chosen as the setting for the film because the writers felt it would be a good place for the giant to land and not be immediately discovered. Bird also liked the idea of having a contrast between the serene countryside and the sci-fi robot. Number 33, one reason Bird was drawn to setting the film in the 1950s was because it had a wholesome surface with a lot of paranoia underneath, something he felt matched the theme of the film as well. Number 34, the film takes place in October of 1957 during the Cold War. The Soviets launched Sputnik, the first man-made satellite, in orbit on October 4th, 1957. The Soviets and Sputnik are referenced multiple times throughout the film. Number 35, Hogarth was voiced by Eli Marienthal, who was 12 years old at the time. He would later go on to lend his voice to more WB cartoons like Batman Beyond and Static Shock. Number 36, the animation team filmed Marienthal while he was recording his lines. Many of Hogarth's animations in the film were based off Marienthal's movements while he recorded. Number 37, Marienthal also influenced Hogarth's design. Hogarth was originally going to have red hair and freckles, but changed it to dark brown hair to mimic Marienthal. Number 38, forget his animated work because after The Iron Giant, Marienthal played Matt Stifler, the younger brother in the American Pie films. Number 39, the voice of Annie Hughes, Hogarth's mother, was provided by Jennifer Aniston. The character was a play on the typical 50s housewife archetype, but writers wanted to break the mold by making her a younger, single mother. Number 40, Hogarth and his mother's last name Hughes is a reference to the story's original author, Ted Hughes. Number 41, Christopher McDonald was picked for the voice of the government agent Kent Mansley because he had the perfect combination of good looks and strength, plus he could also be funny, self-deprecating, and just plain evil. Number 42, Kent Mansley was designed to look like the perfect stereotypical father that would fit in with Annie and Hogarth. Number 43, the beatnik artist Dean is played by Will and Grace star Harry Connick Jr. And he was chosen because he, quote, just exuded that cool cat kind of beatnik mentality. Number 44, the writers revealed in the film's commentary that the reason Dean was made a beatnik was to reinforce some of the movie's themes. The beat movement was seen as threatening to older generations during the 60s, but the fear was born mostly out of misunderstanding. Number 45, the voice of the robot was provided by Fast and Furious star Vin Diesel. Diesel felt a special connection with the giant, saying he felt like they were both bulls in a china shop. Number 46, before deciding on Vin Diesel, actors Peter Cullen, Sean Connery, Frank Welker, and James Earl Jones were all considered for the part. Number 47, to this day, The Iron Giant remains the best rated film that Vin Diesel has ever performed formed in. Sorry, The Last Witch Hunter. Number 48, years later, he would go on to play the character of Brute in Guardians of the Galaxy. Diesel really does seem to have a knack for playing the clumsy giant. Number 49, in an interview, Diesel said that Bird directed like a conductor and would often give notes on a performance while it was happening just by waving his hands. Number 50, excluding grunts and yells, the giant only speaks a total of 53 words over the course of the film. Well, that's better than poor old Groot. Number 51, due to the failure of Warner Brothers' previous animated feature film, Quest for Camelot, the budget for the Iron Giant was significantly lower than usual, as was the film's production cycle. Number 52, the low budget also significantly reduced the size of the staff. Instead of seeing this as 
a limitation though, Bird took it as an opportunity to reduce the number of managers involved in the project. Number 53, three quarters of the team on the Iron Giant came from Quest for Camelot. Guess that other quarter was all the managers. Number 54, the production was a departure from the traditional animated film workload. Other animation studios such as Disney would often have animators work on a specific character in scenes. Instead, Bird designated that teams complete whole sequences of animation at once, which proved to be more productive and collaborative for the teams. Number 55, Bird also reserved spots on his team for animation students from CalArts. This also helped to increase the workforce despite the low budget. Number 56, Bird was so impressed by some of the students' work, he allowed them to animate a full sequence on their own. Fittingly, it was a sequence that took place in a classroom. Number 57, the film was produced in widescreen as opposed to the standard aspect ratio because Bird wanted to emulate the 1950s movies that had partially inspired the film. It also helped to portray the immense size of the giant. Number 58, Bird had even wanted to start the film with the classic Cinemascope logo as a joke, but Cinemascope copyright holder Fox wouldn't allow it. Bird was particularly upset about this because he had worked so closely with Fox in the past on their programs such as The Simpsons. Not cool, Fox. Number 59, Warner Brothers originally wanted the film to begin with the studio logo with Bugs Bunny in a tux taking a bite out of a carrot. Bird felt that this would send the audience the signal that this was a typical movie for kids. Instead, Bird put in a logo styled like one used in older Looney Tunes cartoons. Number 60, Bugs did eventually find his way into the film though as a small, Easter egg hidden in Hogar's toy chest. Blink and you miss it. Number 61, Bird did more than just direct the film, he also did a fair share of animation. The scene in the junkyard where Hogarth drinks espresso and rants to Dean was personally animated by Bird himself. Number 62, the opening scene of the film where the camera focuses on Sputnik in space and then flies into the eye of a hurricane on Earth was particularly difficult to make. Bird explained in the film's commentary that animating a transition like that requires a lot of effort and was even told that it would be impossible with the studio's low budget. Number 63, there was another Another scene that was storyboarded for after the giant lands in the ocean that was cut from the film. Originally, there was meant to be several more ships and even a tanker with over 100 men on board. Bird said he had backstories in his mind for every character in that scene. Number 64, the sequence of shots where the giant is revealed took over a year to complete. The scene features several perspective changes which were difficult to achieve. Number 65, Bird and his team used a software known as Elastic Reality to help speed up the animation process. All of the landscapes were animated using Elastic Reality. While this is a common way of animating nowadays, the software was still relatively new at the time. Number 66, Bird has said that one of the things about the film that he's most proud of is how real the character seemed. He recalled hearing the audience react audibly to scenes where Hogarth was smacked in the face with a branch. This was something particularly hard to accomplish with animation because most cartoons often showed characters surviving much worse. Number 67, the Warner Brothers executives were concerned with the film's marketability and suggested to Brad that he add more characters, pets, and sidekicks to the film. Fortunately, he was given another enough creative control to not have to include these. Number 68, the giant's official height is 50 feet tall. However, his model's height in the film would often fluctuate by about 10 feet or so in order to make the giant more menacing or to just keep him in frame. Number 69, one question never addressed in the film is why the Iron Giant is on Earth. Bird revealed in an interview that it's something that he was hesitant to put in the film because he felt explaining the giant's backstory would be a distraction from the actual story and would only leave more questions. Number 70, there was a deleted scene from the film of the giant having a dream. The dream revealed that he was part of an army and briefly showed the army of giants invading and destroying a planet. This scene would later be added to the 2015 Signature Edition. Number 71, as for how the giant ended up on Earth, Bird said that some images during production suggested that the giant had become separated from a convoy of robots and drifted aimlessly through space for some time before crashing into Earth. Number 72, another question never directly answered in the film, is the fate of Hogar's father. Pictures around the house reveal his father was a jet fighter pilot, but no information beyond that was present. Number 73, the film both begins and ends with beeping. The beeping in the beginning of the film was Sputnik, and the end is the beeping from the giant reassembling himself. Bird did this to symbolize paranoia and its transition into understanding. Number 74, if you pay close attention to how the giant moves throughout the film, you'll notice it starts off as very robotic and gradually becomes more human-like. The filmmakers wanted the giant to pick up Hogarth's mannerisms over the course of the film to show how the giant had grown from pet to friend to hero. Number 75, Bird was born in 1957, the same year the movie takes place. Number 76, Frank and Ollie, the two train men that Kent interviews, are caricatures of Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnston, who are two of the famed Disney's nine old 
old men that Bird met early in his career. The two voiced their caricatures and also made an appearance in Bird's The Incredibles. Number 77, the whipped cream injected Twinkie that Hogarth eats towards the beginning of the film is something that Bird used to do as a child. He called this creation the Turbo Twinkie. Number 78, the Superman comic that Hogarth shows the giant is Action Comics number 188. Fitting in with the Iron Giant's themes, the issue features the hero who becomes radioactive and then a threat to the planet. Number 79, if you listen closely during this scene, you can hear the theme of the 1940s Superman cartoon play briefly in the background. Number 80, in one scene, we see that the giant has bitten off part of a car with a license plate that says A113. This is a reference to a classroom at Cal Arts and is a recurring Easter egg hidden throughout many of Brad Bird's films. Number 81, he also hid another recurring Easter egg in the film. During the scene where Dean reads the paper, the headline reads, Disaster Scene as Catastrophe Looms. The same headline has appeared in many other films such as The Incredibles and Lady in the Tramp. Number 82, one of the children who was searching for the giant towards the end of the film was voiced by Brad Bird's son Michael. Michael also provided the voice of Hogarth during all of the film's temp tracks. Number 83, another very subtle easter egg is seen during the scene where Kent talks to the general over the phone. The oven mitt hanging from the cabinet is designed after Family Dog, a short that Brad Bird directed for Steven Spielberg. Number 84, remember that scene where the giant is carrying Hogarth that night as they search for food? If you look carefully in the night sky, you can see a moving star. This was meant to be Sputnik and Bird revealed in the film's commentary that he never expected anyone to notice, but wanted to add it in anyway. Number 85, during the film's final scenes, the giant turns into a weapon and begins attacking everything in sight. Bird said it was difficult to show the giant's power without actually having him kill any military. He thought that if the giant did kill anyone, it would have been too hard for the audience to still see him as a good guy in the end. Number 86, there was a debate during the film's production on whether or not the giant should use his weaponry to destroy the missile at the end of the film. According to the film story department head Jeffrey Lynch, it was important to the story that the giant sacrificed himself and never allow himself to become a weapon ever again. Number 87, trailer promotions for the film as well as the TV promotion on Cartoon Network's Toonami were voiced by Peter Cullen. Cullen also provides the voice for another popular Iron Giant, Optimus Prime. Number 88, in one scene we see Hogarth's class watching a film called Atomic Holocaust. This is based on Cold War era films shown to children during that period that instructed them to duck and cover under their desks in the event of a nuclear bombing. Number 89, Bird's favorite moment during production was when the crew gathered to test the scene in the film when Hogarth explains to the giant what a soul is. According to him, people in the room spontaneously started to cry. Number 90, at the premiere of the Iron Giant at Man's Chinese Theater, a 12 by 6 foot concrete slab was revealed with the footprint and signature of the giant. Number 91, tragically, Hughes passed away in 1998, a year before the film he helped inspire could make it to theaters. Number 92, Warner Brothers didn't give the team a release date until April 1999, four months before the film's official release. Number 93, the film was rushed in order to make it a summer release. Because of this, marketing for the film suffered severely. In fact, Warner Brothers was so unprepared for marketing the Iron Giant that the teaser poster ended up being the only poster that was released. Number 94, there were plans to have a marketing deal with Burger King that would have helped the film, but Warner Brothers never followed through. No robot toys with our burgers for us, apparently. Number 95, during the film's test screenings, it scored incredibly high. Bird said that the scores were the highest that Warner Brothers had seen in 15 years. Number 96, Unfortunately, even though the film was received well by critics and audiences, it was a huge failure at the box office, making back only $31 million out of its relatively small $70 million budget. Warner Brothers president Lorenzo D. Bonaventura commented on the movie's performance by saying, People always say to me, why don't you make smarter family movies? The lesson is, every time you do, you get slaughtered. Number 97, critics may have loved it, but Bird didn't always agree with why. In response to several comparisons to E.T., Bird dismissed them, saying, E.T. doesn't go kicking ass. He doesn't make the army pay. Certainly you risk having your hip credentials taken away if you don't invoke anything sad or genuinely heartfelt. Number 98, the film has since become a cult classic, winning several awards, including nine Annie Awards. It was even nominated for the American Film Institute's Top 10 Animated Films list. Number 99, the film has since become a regular installment in Cartoon Network's movie marathons, often played during holidays like Christmas and Thanksgiving, partially lending to the film's popularity several years later. Number 100, in 2015, the Iron Giant Signature Edition was released in select theaters for a limited time. This version of the film was remastered and included two new scenes. The two added scenes were the aforementioned dream sequence and a cut scene between Dean and Annie. Number 101, the Signature Edition will also release as an Ultimate Collector's Edition in September 2016. The new edition will come with a figurine of the giant, a 32-page art book, and a letter from Bird to the fans 
fans that supported the film for so long. Number 102, the added scenes from the film were animated by Duncan Studios. Many staff members of Duncan Studios were involved with the making of the original Iron Giant film. Number 103, the final scene of the film wasn't Bird saying he wanted a sequel. The giant reassembling himself was supposed to be an abstract representation of the line, souls don't die from earlier in the film. Number 104, the final scene was also supposed to be an homage to old horror movies that would end with the end, or is it? He considered putting those five words at the end of the movie, but decided not because he thought it felt cheap. Number 105, Bird said that if Warner Brothers was to do a sequel for the movie, he probably wouldn't be interested. He said, I hope they wouldn't want to do a sequel unless they came up with a fantastic idea, and I hope they would want to do it as well as we've done it, at the very least. Number 106, while there were currently no plans for an Iron Giant sequel, the book itself did receive a sequel titled The Iron Woman, which tackled themes of sexism and environmentalism. And finally, fact number 107, the re-release of the film had been in the works for years, with some plans to release it in 3D or possibly in IMAX, but none of these plans worked out. So you'll just have to sit tight, Iron Giant fans. Thanks for watching 107 Facts You Should Know About Iron Giant. Who's your favorite character from the film? Sound off in the comments. And if you like this video, be sure to check out some of our other 107 Facts videos by clicking the annotations or the links in the description below. We have new videos dropping every week, so let us know which animated movie or show you want us to cover next. And if you like getting more from your cartoons, subscribe to Channel Frederator because remember, Frederator loves you.